NEET Crash Course Biology. In today's lecture, we will be doing the synopsis or an overview of morphology of flowering plants. So what exactly do you mean by morphology? The study of external features of a plant or any organism for that matter is referred to as morphology. Now when you look at the external features of a typical plant, you can identify the aerial or the shoot system and the subterranean root system. Isn't it? So basically you can identify the root system and the shoot system which constitute the major parts of the morphology of plant. Now what is a root? Now basically there are different types of roots based on how they form, based on their origin. Now you all know that roots originate from a part on the seed that is referred to as the radical. If they develop anywhere else on the plant body other than from the radical, then we call it as adventitious root. If you talk about some of the uh, monocot plants, like for example in case of wheat, they have a bunch of roots which emerge from the base of the stem which is referred to as the fibrous root. And then in plants such as grass, in monstera and banyan tree, you have roots which emerge from parts of a plant other than from the seed. Like I told you, the embryonic axis has a radical and if it originates from any other part other than the radical, then we say that it is an adventitious root. So a fibrous root is also a form of adventitious root because in case of fibrous root, now suppose this is the ground and this is the plant that is developing, there is a main axis of the root that develops and this axis of the mother axis of the root initially and very soon dies out and then a bunch of roots originate from the base of the stem. So we can consider these roots which originate from the base of the stem which make up the fibrous root actually as adventitious root. Now if you consider what are the different parts of the root. Now before I go into the parts of the root, I told you that there is one type of root system where the main axis dies out and several bundles of roots develop from the base of the stem and we called this as the fibrous root. There is another type of root system where you have a very good organization of roots. So where is basically the mother axis or the main axis of the root that develops from the radical. It remains intact and then secondary branches emerge from them. Now these are called as the secondary roots and even finer branches emerge from the secondary root. So basically you have the main axis which is called the primary root, the second one the second branches which are called the secondary root and the third degree branches which are referred to as the tertiary root. If the root system has this kind of organization then we call it as a tap root system as opposed to the adventitious system that we see in case of fibrous root. Now, if you see the tip of the root or uh, closer to the ends of the root, you can identify three distinct regions. Now, as you can see, the very end of the root is covered by a thimble-like, a cap-like structure over here. And this cap, which protects the tip of the root because the tip of the root has wall-less cells which are actively dividing. And this region, which protects the tip of the root since it grows into the soil, is referred to as the root cap. Okay, then a few millimeter above the root cap, you can see this zone. This is referred to as the zone of meristematic activity. Now, it is where you have cells which have very thin cell, cell membrane and very dense cytoplasm and which are actively dividing. And these cells which are actively dividing are referred to as meristematic cells. So above the meristematic zone, you can see a, a zone where the cells are rapidly elongating in their length. They are expanding. Now this area of the root where the cells are elongating or the cells are expanding, this is referred to as the root of elongation. And finally you have the uppermost region of the root that is referred to as the region of maturation. It is also called the zone of differentiation because it is in this region you have differentiation of cells that is cells become parenchymatous or colenchymatous. The xylem and phloem which are the vascular tissues get differentiated. So in this region you have cells which are differentiating and that's why we call them as 
the zone of maturation or the zone of differentiation and this is also the zone of absorption because you can see these unicellular cytoplasmic outgrowths which are originating from these root cells which are present on the outermost layer of the root which is called the epiblema and this uh, these structures which are hair like structures which are actually cytoplasmic projections are referred to as the root hair so we can easily identify the region of maturation because it is that part of the root where active absorption of minerals and water takes place okay now moving to modification of root i told you about the tap root how the tap root is organized there is a primary mother axis which branches into secondary branches called secondary roots and then which in turn branch into the tertiary roots if we look into the modification of tap root specifically remember tap root is not an adventitious root tap root develops from the radical of the seed okay so we can now we will look into the modification of tap root for storage of food now all these which are mentioned over here these are all tap roots for storage of food now notice how some of the tap roots become conical in shape as you see in case of carrot so this is simply referred to as the conical root the scientific name of carrot is docus carota and then you can see in case of turnip and in case of beetroot how the base of the root is extremely swollen isn't it and then it suddenly tapers down like this so this type of a tap root which is also meant for storage is referred to as the nappy form root which is seen in beetroot beta vulgaris and turnip that is brassica rapa and then you have the fusiform root now if you see uh, radish for example now here in radish what happens is the me the middle part of this root is somewhat swollen but at both the ends you can see it tapers down like this so this is the base of the root which is beneath that of the ground so this is the ground level if you consider you can see how the two ends of the root are narrowed down but the middle part of the root is somewhat uh, swollen and this kind of a root is referred to as what is it referred to as it's referred to as the fusiform root which is seen in the case of radish that is raphanus sativa so we have classified the tap root based on its shape whether it is spindle shaped or whether it is fusiform whether it is broad at the base and tapers down suddenly whether it is conical or cone shaped accordingly we have classified the tap root modified for storage of food tap root modified for respiration now if you consider some of the plants which are living in mangrove uh, living in uh, uh, swampy or marshy areas like for example in case of mangroves you can imagine now 24 7 or most of the time the ground is covered with water in this particular case it is mostly uh, flooded isn't it in mangroves it is mostly flooded so how do these roots breathe so what they do is they give out these projections these vertical projections which emerge from the surface of the ground see how the root is growing above the ground level or above the water level and it this is put out above the water level so that it can absorb the atmospheric air and you can see that there are minute openings which are referred to as these pores are referred to as the lenticels the lenticels will absorb the air from the atmospheric uh, absorb oxygen from the atmospheric air and now why, uh, why these roots need to be put out above water because always in these plants the root system and the ground is completely submerged in water so they may die because of uh, deficiency of oxygen as a result these roots grow upwards they grow upright above the surface of water and they are provided with specific openings called pores called lenticels to take up oxygen that's why these roots are referred to as the breathing roots now you can also write down some examples breathing roots are seen in rhizophora all these are mangroves, Avicennia, and Sonerasia. So these are some of the examples for the modification of taproot system for. Now this is also a taproot system only. It is modified for breathing. It is mostly found in plants growing in swampy and marshy areas where the ground is almost always submerged in water. Okay. 
now coming to modification of adventitious roots now these are adventitious roots these are not normal tap root systems that i'm talking about which develop from the radical now what do you mean by adventitious root adventitious root means it develops from any other part other than the radical literally in latin the word adventitious means that is coming from abroad coming from elsewhere so since the roots are growing elsewhere other than the radical of the seed we can call these roots as adventitious roots okay now see here the first example is a tuberous root a tuberous root is a root which has an irregular appearance as you can see here the example for this is the sweet potato and then you can see how many many tuberous roots are bundled up together and this is referred to as a bundle or a fascicle this is what is called a fasciculated root a fasciculated root is seen in dahlia and asparagus and then you can see how the root has regular swelling so there is a swelling here there is a swelling here there is a swelling here at regular intervals it has swellings giving it a beaded appearance now this is referred to as moniliform root example for moniliform root is momordica and portulaca and even spinach the common spinach that is called the basilla okay and then you can see how the root has these ring like thickenings like how it looks like segmentation in annelida isn't it there are ring like thickenings present all over the root this is called as annulated root the best example for annulated root is cephalus and then you can see how only the ends of the roots are swollen and when the ends of the roots are swollen we call it as nodulose root the best example for nodulose root is mango ginger that is curcuma amada okay don't confuse between nodulose versus nodulated root if they ask you any question on nodulated root please remember nodulated root is not adventitious root it is a tap root but it has a root which has lot of nodules or swellings on it now why does it have these nodules because it contains it is a symbiotic association between the roots of the plant and the nitrogen fixing bacteria okay so they have nodules or outgrowths so nodulose root are adventitious root which are and now all these roots that i discussed they are also adventitious root that are meant for what that are meant for storage of food so we are discussing about the adventitious roots which are meant for the storage of food so we talked about the tuberous root the second one i told you bundles fasciculated root in dahlia and asparagus third one i told you the root has a beaded appearance as in momordica portulaca and basilla fourth one i told you there are ring like thickenings along the storage root or adventitious root as in cephalus which is annulated and the fifth one like i said the roots at their ends are swollen and this is what is seen in ginger that is mango ginger it is called the nodulose root okay So now we have the modification of adventitious root for support. So again I am talking about not tap root, not the root which originates from the radical but roots which come from elsewhere like I said literally adventitious means coming from abroad. So adventitious root in this case I am talking about adventitious root for support. it is meant to provide support to the plant body the best example here you can consider is the prop root of banyan and the stilt root of maize and also the stilt root is also seen in another plant that is called pandanus or screw pine okay now see how these roots originate from horizontal branches this is a horizontal branch from the under surface of the horizontal branch you have these roots which start growing and the moment they reach the ground they become pillar like see 
they are becoming like a pillar and they start supporting the weight of the plant so they are weight bearing structures they are mostly meant for mechanical support in stilt roots mostly in maize and sugarcane you can see how the node which is present just above the ground closer to the ground you can see how roots are growing from these nodes and which anchor the plant to the soil so it is mostly meant for providing mechanical support now we shall move on to the stem so we saw some of the few important discussion uh, some of the few important adaptations we saw when it came to the uh, root of the plant now let us discuss about the stem now stem as you all know is the aerial part not necessarily are all stem parts aerial because you will be seeing that some of the stems they grow they prefer to grow on the surface of the soil then they are called as sub, sub aerial and some of them are known to grow underground then they are referred to as uh, underground stem modification but largely if you know what a stem is you know that the first thing that comes to your mind it is the aerial green growing upright which is growing away from the ground that is negatively geotrophic towards the light that is positively phototrophic part of the plant and you know that a stem bears branches it bears leaves it bears flowers it bears fruit okay so like i mentioned positively phototropic and negatively geotropic is what we see and in the stem we see special parts which are called as nodes from where a branch emerges or from where a leaf emerges or from where a flower emerges and the area between the two adjacent nodes is referred to as the internode we shall look into some of the modifications of stem here now here again we are going to discuss to begin with what we are going to talk about now these are the underground modifications of the stem now the underground modification of stem the first one is rhizome the first thing that comes to your mind when i talk about rhizome is ginger now if you have seen the stem of ginger how the stem of ginger is uh, it's branched and then it has rows of nodes like this and from the nodes emerge certain leafy structures which are referred to as the scaly leaves on one end it has an apical meristem which usually can give rise to a new plant when it is planted isn't it now this type of an underground stem which grows in a creeping horizontal direction under the ground and that is in the under the surface of the soil is referred to as the rhizome of ginger then we have stem tuber like the best example being potato you all have seen potato on the potato you have these structures which are referred to as the eye the eye represents the node and when you keep potato for a long time you can see these buds coming out of the eye isn't it and if you plant this potato you can see that it is uh, it can give rise to a new plant and it is covered by a corky layer on the outside the brown corky covering on the potato so inside it is it stores a lot of starch so again it is an underground stem modification for storage it is referred to as the underground stem tuber okay so remember there are eyes which represent the nodes and the buds which emerge from the nodes are capable of growing into new plants then we have a corm a corm is a form of a rhizome but it is very very massive i will show you the picture or the image it is massive in size okay it is swollen it is rounded it develops from the base of the stem it also has nodes which bear certain scaly leaves on them and this corm also has buds on it and it also bears adventitious roots on its under surface to anchor the plant to the soil the best example of underground stem corn is zameen khand which is scientifically called amorphophallus and colocasia and then you also have crocus another example then we have arum okay so these are some of the examples for corn here you can see i was describing the corm just now so you can see these rings of nodes isn't it and the region between the nodes are referred to as the internodes and you can see how these scaly leaves or catafils are formed at these nodes and can you also see that there are 
um, these daughter combs which originate it buds into these daughter swollen structures which can also give rise to the new plant and on its under surface you can see how there are roots and since these are roots developing on the stem and not from the radical it has been named as adventitious root and here you can see how an a bud is forming from the eye of the potato and then this is an excellent example for the rhizome of ginger isn't it see there is a bud at the apex over here here also a bud is giving rise to an upright aerial branch correct and then there are a lot of adventitious roots that are growing from the under surface of rhizome then coming to sub aerial stem modifications now except sucker it's actually sub sucker can also be considered as an underground stem modification okay but it is included here so i'm being specific to you here it is underground except that we have runner we have stolon and we have offset offset is of course aquatic and runner and stolon they both prefer to grow on the surface of the ground not underneath the ground surface and that's why they are referred to as the sub aerial stem modifications so remember that these are the stems which grow prostate as in they grow horizontally and how do they grow not underground not upright like an aerial branch but they grow on the surface of the ground now see the example for runner runner is seen in grasses in oxalis okay and also in plants like centella you can see this is the main shoot of the grass and from the base of this main shoot you can see a narrow green branch that is emerging which runs on the surface of the ground and after growing to a certain distance it again has a node which gives rise to a new branch again from the base of this branch another horizontal narrow and green branch will grow and that again after growing a certain distance will give out to a new plant body so in this case as you can see this runner is growing it is a narrow and green and tube like or cylindrical structure which has many nodes and at every node it gives rise to a new crown or a new uh, aerial shoot okay and this is referred to as a runner of grass how is the stolon of mint and strawberry different from runner of grass so remember you can see stolon in the case of mint jasmine and wild strawberry okay now how is this different is can you see how it is arching above the ground see this is the level of the ground it arches above the ground to a certain extent and then it again goes down meets the ground and where it meets the ground it forms a new shoot so whenever you have this upwardly arching stem which originates from the base of the crown or base of the main aerial shoot we refer to it as stolon now in sucker what happens is this like i told you is underground now suppose this is the ground which i am drawing in red here now see how this green branch which i am highlighting now it originates from the base of this aerial shoot and notice how it is growing horizontally under the ground itself but after a certain distance it starts taking an oblique turn it comes up to the surface of the ground and it gives rise to a new aerial shoot okay so most of the distance it grows underground horizontally and it originates from the base of the aerial branch but after a while it starts taking a turn you can see how it was horizontally growing then it takes a turn like this it takes a turn it meets the ground it emerges from the level of the ground and it gives rise to an upward or an upright aerial shoot so this is referred to as the sucker and sucker is seen in pineapple banana and chrysanthemum okay then you have offset which is mostly seen in pistia and icornia i uh this offset is nothing but a runner except that it is having a single internode notice that in between this is a node that is originating it, it originates from the base of this uh, shoot 
isn't it and then it travels a certain distance gives rise to a next node so the area between the two nodes this area between the two nodes is called as an internode so an offset has only one internode to it okay and it is aquatic that means it is growing on the water surface so this is the water surface it is found in aquatic plants like pistia and icornia so these are referred to as whatever we discussed here these are referred to as the sub aerial stem modifications like runner stolon and to be uh, strictly speaking sucker like i told you it grows horizontally under the ground and then it takes uh, it grows obliquely upwards so it is actually considered as an underground stem modification but it is largely in many books it is included under sub aerial stem modifications and then offset which is not terrestrial but it is aquatic okay aerial stem modification aerial means above the ground so what we first discussed was underground stem modification then we discussed on the surface of the ground partly under surface partly over surface and then on the surface of water that is sub aerial stem modification now we are going to discuss about modifications completely above ground that is aerial stem modification so you have the best examples being cactus that is philoclade now the green fleshy and succulent structures which you see in case of a cactus is nothing but the stem okay and then you can see in some cases the stem is modified into thorn a thorn is a very pointed and a woody structure it has a core formed out of wood and then you can see how there is some bud axillary bud which develops into a spring like a coiled structure which offers which can uh, intertwine and which can also uh, encircle around the support which can grow around the support and this sensitive structure which develops from an axillary bud uh, is referred to as a tendril and in some plants you have these fleshy structures which are called cladode which are roughly which look like a lobe like this a curved lobe like this okay and these are actually and where is the actual leaf the actual leaf get reduced into scaly leaves that are present at the axil of the cladode so these are referred to as cladodes as you see in ruscus and asparagus and tendrils you find them in passiflora in members of the gourd family isn't it and thorns are found in bougainvillea and stem like i told opuntia in opuntia the stem is modified into a flattened succulent structure that is referred to as the philoclade now moving on to the leaf what are the parts of the leaf since we are talking about the shoot we need to talk about the leaf as well so now you see the part that is the stalk of the leaf is called the petiole and the blade of the leaf the actual photosynthetic portion of the leaf is the lamina and the vein that is very very prominent passing through the mid region of the lamina is referred to as the midrib and the boundaries are called the leaf margin the very tip of the leaf is referred to as the leaf apex and you also can see these green colored leaf like structures which occur on either sides of the petiole or the base of the leaf the base the leaf base is where the leaf is attached to the stem and on the either side of the leaf base you can see these leafy structures which are referred to as the stipule the point on the main axis or the stem or the mother axis where the leaf originates is called the node the area between the two nodes is referred to as the internode so here you can see and mostly in some cases what happens is if this is the leaf the leaf uh, the petiole which is attached to the stem it becomes bulbous like this so this is the main stem if you imagine there is a bulbous leaf base which is referred to as the pulvinus this is seen in the case of leguminous plants okay so in some cases the leaf base becomes bulbous in nature it is referred to as the pulvinus venation you know about the two types of venation if the venation is like in the in the pattern of that is the arrangement of the veins 
on the surface of the leaf are like the spider web like appearance then it is referred to as reticulate venation if the veins are disposed parallel to one another then it is referred to as parallel venation the most common example for parallel venation is the banana leaf as you can see how there is a main rib over here the most prominent rib which is the mid rib and how all the other veins are parallelly disposed to one another and at right angles to the mid rib the major rib of the leaf so there is only one prominent mid rib in this particular case and how the veins are parallelly arranged that's why this is referred to as the parallel venation okay now leaf types we had to discuss now there is two types of leaf for example if this is a leaf or if i say the leaf is divided it is by it is dissected at its outer margin into lobes however these lobes are not touching the mid rib so this kind of a leaf which is entire where its margin is dissected or it is broken into fragments which do not touch the mid rib they are referred to as the simple leaf what about a compound leaf in a compound leaf there is an axis and imagine if these uh, if these lobes or these broken parts of the leaf or these broken margins of leaf were to reach the mid rib then what would happen is the entire leaf would be divided into a structure bearing individual leaflets on the either sides that means the leaf is dissected into individual units which are referred to as the leaflets so then it is referred to as a compound leaf so a simple leaf is entire it has an entire lamina okay and this axis of the simple leaf is nothing but the we call this as the mid rib isn't it and this is the petiole that is the stalk of the leaf is called petiole whereas here you can see how the entire leaf is divided into individual leaflets then what do we call this axis of the compound leaf now we call this axis of the compound leaf as the rachis and these smaller leaves which are formed by the dissection of this uh, leaf into individual units these units are referred to as the leaflets so basically you must remember the simple example between simple leaf and compound leaf and compound leaf is seen in lot of plants like for example in neem plant you can see and even in tamarind plant in gulmohar plant you can see this kind of a compound leaf so two types of leaves that is simple leaf in which the lamina is entire and in which it is bisected i mean in which it is dissected into individual units called leaflets then we call this leaf as what is referred to as a compound leaf of course in compound leaf there are different types that is pinnately compound and palmately compound now in pinnately compound what i have shown it here is exactly pinnately compound where there is a rachis and there are two rows of leaflets on the either side so we call this type of arrangement as a pinnately compound if it is a palmately compound then this is the rachis then from the tip of the rachis you have leaflets all of the leaflets originate from a common point on the rachis and this type of a compound leaf where all the leaflets originate from the common point on the tip of the rachis is referred to as the palmately compound so two types of uh, compound leaves again pinnately compound leaves and palmately compound leaves okay now moving on to phyllotaxy phyllotaxy is the mode of arrangement of leaf on the stem or its branches basically there are three major phyllotaxy one is called alternate phyllotaxy that is seen in hibiscus mustard and sunflower opposite phyllotaxy that is seen in guava and calotropis and whorled phyllotaxy that is seen in nerium and alstonia now with looking at these images you will understand what alternate and opposite and whorled phyllotaxy is in opposite phyllotaxy sorry in alternate phyllotaxy each node has only one leaf emerging out of it but on the opposite sides see in alternate sides so here the leaf originated on the right side here it is the left side again right side and left side so there is one leaf per node and how are the successive leaves arranged on alternate sides and this is what is referred to as alternate phyllotaxy it is seen in case of hibiscus 
and even sunflower and mustard okay then in case of guava as well as in case of calotropis if you look at the node over here two leaves are emerging both in the opposite directions isn't it they're opposing each other so this kind of a phyllotaxy where there are two leaves per node and uh, and they are located or they are disposed opposite to each other is referred to as opposite phyllotaxy and then you have world phyllotaxy see this is a node and many leaves are coming out there's a circlet of leaves one leaf is over here one leaf on this side and one leaf on this side so from one node you have more than two leaves so here you can see very clearly this is the node there's one leaf behind one leaf over here and one leaf over here so it is a ring of leaves a circlet of leaves which originate from the node on a main stem this is referred to as the world phyllotaxy as in the case of the devil's tree alstonia and the nerium plant okay modification of leaves now the first modification we are going to discuss only some of the important modifications of leaf over here the first modification that we will be discussing is uh, the tendril now this is a sweet pea plant where it is if you can imagine if you can guess you can tell me what kind of a leaf is this yes it is a compound leaf is it palmate or pinnate it is pinnate because you can see how there is a rachis and on the either sides of the rachis you can find leaflets which are arranged they are not originating from a common point and notice how some of the apical leaflets over here they have become modified into these coiled structures which are referred to as leaf tendril so remember in garden pea that is pisum sativum some of the apical leaflets get modified into tendrils and then you have leaf spines in cactus the sharp pointed structures that you see on the cactus they are actually leaves they're not thorns they're called leaf spines see they don't have a woody core inside if they have a woody core then you will call them as a thorn but here these spine like structures are referred to as the leaf spine now why are the leaves modified into spine in the case of cactus to check transpiration isn't it because it lives in uh, desert conditions it has to conserve a lot of water in some cases the actual part of the leaf for example this is acacia now in acacia you can see it has a pinnately compound leaf isn't it it has a bipinnately compound leaf what do you mean by bipinnately compound it means that there is a rachis there is a secondary branch like this and on the secondary branch there are leaves okay so this is the primary rachis and this is the secondary rachis so this is referred to as a bipinnately sorry this is primary and this is secondary so we call such a type of a compound leaf as bipinnately compound leaf this is seen in case of gulmohar it is seen in case of acacia okay and uh, uh, this is what we see in acacia the main part of the leaf falls off whereas the petiole of the leaf the petiole is the stalk of the leaf isn't it that part of the leaf it becomes expanded and enlarged into green photosynthetic structures which are referred to as the phyllode so the actual part of the leaf falls off and it is only the petiole that gets flattened into green photosynthetic parts which are referred to as phyllodes then in case of nepenthes or pitcher plant see how the leaf is modified into a flask like structure which is referred to as the pitcher the tip of the leaf is modified into a lid which fits onto the pitcher okay so this is an insectivorous plant the leaf is modified into a flask like structure the apex of the leaf or the tip of the leaf is modified into lid Dionia is nothing but the Venus flytrap. So this is the petiole of the leaf. That is the leaf stalk, isn't it? And then see how the leaf is mod uh, modified into two valves. Like uh, this is one valve, this is a second valve, and there are a lot of cilia at their margins. And say for example, an insect goes and sits over here, then these two valves will shut, they will close, and the plant will feed on the insect from within. And because it has uh, it is very very sensitive since you can also see that there are certain hairy structures present on the inside of the leaf so how the leaf is modified in ad order to capture the insect in the case of the venus flytrap or the dionia 
then you have utricularia utricularia is called the bladder wort now what happens for utricularia or bladder wort is tiny structures are found now this is a plant where uh, much of it is immersed in water so inside the water you can see that the leaves are modified into these tiny compartments which are referred to as bladders and they have an opening they have a trap door and they have sensitive hairs or valves on the trap door if any insect were to enter into this chamber these doors these valves will open these filaments will open inwards but they don't open outwards so they allow the insect to go in but the insect will get trapped inside and it cannot come back out and inside it has digestive glands which secrete certain secretions to digest the body of the insect. So here the leaf is modified into tiny bladders or sac like structures which are provided with uh, glandular hair and wall valves on the outside which act as a trap door and this is seen in the case of utricularia or bladder wort. Now coming to inflorescence, inflorescence is nothing but the arrangement of the flowers on a floral axis okay so we don't call these as the flowers which are arranged on the floral axis we call them as florets these are units of inflorescence which are referred to as uh, the florets now what is a racemose inflorescence now this is the main axis of inflorescence okay now in this main axis of inflorescence which is called as the peduncle on the peduncle or the rachis notice it does not end in a flower but it can continuously keep growing in its length so when the peduncle or the rachis or the main inflorescence axis does not end in a flower we call this type of inflorescence as the racemose inflorescence and can you see how the flowers at the apex are younger and the flowers at the bottom are older did you understand so we can see as we move towards the center of the inflorescence from the periphery to the center we move from older flowers to the younger flowers or as we move from below upwards we have older flowers below and younger flowers above and this succession is referred to as the acropetal succession on the axis okay as opposed to uh, racemose inflorescence we have cymose inflorescence once again see the inflorescence axis which is called the peduncle or the rachis notice that it is ending in a flower that means its growth is determinate it cannot keep growing so when it ends in a flower you can see that this type of inflorescence is called a cymose inflorescence in cymose inflorescence the oldest flowers are on the top and the younger flowers are at the base so this is referred to as the basi petal succession so remember in racemose inflorescence the younger ones were at the top and in uh, cymose inflorescence the older flowers are at the apex of the rachis or the peduncle and the younger flowers are towards the bottom so this type of a uh, succession is referred to as the basi petal succession or a basi petal order okay now, if you were to look at some of the important types of uh, racemose inflorescence, so let us first go with racemose inflorescence. I told you in racemose inflorescence, there is a floral axis which does not end in a flower, isn't it? And I told you, younger flowers are towards the apex and as we go to the bottom, we come across the older flowers. Now, this type of uh, racemose inflorescence which is a typical racemose inflorescence is referred to as a simple racemose. Okay, now this is a racemose inflorescence. The first type of racemose inflorescence which I am going to discuss with you now is one with the elongated rachis. So this is the rachis that we are talking about it is elongated in nature and it has a typical arrangement that we saw in racemose inflorescence where the younger flowers are towards the apex and the older flowers are towards the bottom so this is called racemose width so we will divide it into different parts racemose with elongated rachis in that the first type that we are discussing is the simple raceme example for simple raceme is crotolaria Delphinium, Lilium, 
Lupinus, Brassica, Raffanus, Radish, Brassica, Mustard family, Snapdragon, or anti rhinum is the scientific name. So these are the examples of simple racemes. So remember, we are talking about the inflorescence with elongated axis. I have told you already that here the main axis does not end in a flower. It can grow continuously. So is it determinate or indeterminate? It is indeterminate because it grows continuously. Okay. Now the second type under this is referred to as the spike. Now notice the difference in the diagram that I'm showing you here. Again, I'm showing you the ratchets. Again, the younger flowers are at the apex. The older flowers are at the bottom. But did you notice that the flower does not have a pedicel? Now here, the flower had a stalk. The stalk of the flower was referred to as a pedicel. Now in these, the flowers are sessile. So such an inflorescence which is very similar to the first type that is simple raceme where you can see and they also at the base of the flower you can see these leafy structures which are referred to as the bract. Again here it is not ending in a flower at the end of at the tip of what the inflorescence axis. Such an inflorescence where there are sessile e pedicillate that is flowers without a stalk or pedicel which are arranged in acropetal succession is referred to as spike. Now examples for spike are Achyranthus, Adathoda, and Bottle Brush. Bottle Brush is called Callistemon. Okay, so this is the spike. Now the third type is a compound spike. Compound spike means, so what do you mean by compound spike? You have the main ratchets and then which divides into the secondary branches. Each secondary branch has a spike on it. See, it is just like a spike but it has a secondary branching. Now this is seen in the case of Amaranthus. So Achyranthus is simple spike and compound spike in the case of Amaranthus. Now the fourth one is referred to as a spadix. The spadix is nothing but a simple spadix. A simple spadix in the case of Aram. Example for this is Aram and Colocasia. Now in this what happens is there is a floral axis and there are sessile flowers which are born on the floral axis but the entire floral axis is surrounded by a broad leaf like sometimes it is colored also and this particular colored structure leaf like leathery structure is referred to as the bract. Okay, it is also referred to as the spath. So generally in this kind of a simple spadix, this axis that is the ratchis, which is the main axis of inflorescence is very very fleshy. And the flowers born on them are unisexual flowers. So mostly they may be male flowers and female flowers. But important thing is the entire axis is surrounded by a leaf like or sometimes a colored uh, structure which is referred to as the bract or the spath. Now related to spadix is the fifth one. Remember we are talking about racemos with elongated ratchets is the compound spadix. Now in compound spadix that you see in case of banana and coconut, the most common example is coconut. Now in compound spadix, you can again see a fleshy axis which is further branched into the floral axis or the ratchets is branched and then you find sessile flowers over here which may be unisexual male flowers and female flowers and the entire see here the main axis 
the fleshy floral axis was unbranched but here the fleshy floral axis is branched these are the branches first second and third branches and the entire inflorescence is covered with a boat shaped structure which is referred to as again it is the spath the spath or the bract in the case of this kind of a compound spadix becomes boat shaped and becomes leathery in nature okay this is called as a compound spadix the sixth one is called a catkin or an amentum catkin or amentum is seen in mulberry that is morus acalypha it's very important to know few examples then you have betula salix that is willow populus that is poplar betula is birch now these are the flowers which exhibit catkin or amentum it is exactly like spike but it is pendulous it hangs down like this so it also has these flowers which are older at the base and younger at the apex and they also have bracts like this but notice it is hanging down it is pendulous and also the flowers so it is very similar to what it is very similar to a spike but these flowers are mostly unisexual so a catkin is either a male catkin or it is a female catkin because a catkin does not have both male and female flowers on it it has either male flowers or it has female flowers and like i said it is a pendulous what it is a pendulous spike why is it a spike because the flowers don't have pedicel or stalk the last type of racemose inflorescence which has uh, elongated rachis elongated floral axis is referred to as the strobile now this strobile inflorescence is seen in the hop plant the scientific name of the hop plant is humulus lupulus now in this what happens is it is also like spike only this is the main floral axis that is called the rachis or the peduncle the younger flowers are at the apex the older flowers are at the base but they are covered and they are found at the axils of these very very bright and colorful leafy structures which are referred to as the bracts so bracts are very very prominent in the case of strobile or uh, which is also similar to the spike but notice that the flower or the floret is almost entirely covered by these colorful structures which is referred to as the bract and these are the flowers which are present at the axil of the bracts on the rachis or the main axis of the flower so we first discussed we are now discussing the first part of racemos inflorescence that is racemos inflorescence with an elongated rachis in that simple raceme the most classic type of inflorescence i told you that the main axis does not end with the flower and this what do we call this main axis of the inflorescence it is called the rachis or the peduncle and what did we call the stalk of the floret we called it as the pedicel and here you can see younger flowers are towards the apex and older flowers are towards the base okay then in spike we saw how the flowers don't have a stalk in compound spike we saw that there is a second degree branching this is the first degree branching and this is the second degree branching isn't it that is called a compound spike spadix we saw that the main inflorescence axis or the rachis becomes very very fleshy it bears flowers on them unisexual flowers both male and female are present and they are covered by a colorful leathery structure that is called a bract or the spath and then when the main branch or the fleshy branch of inflorescence becomes branched further then we refer to it as uh the compound spadix in catkin i told you it is pendulous if this is the branch of the tree it hangs down from the branch of the tree and as a result it is pendulous and it is unisexual and in strobile we saw how the flowers originate from the axils of these colorful structures which are leafy appendages called bracts okay so now the second type of racemos inflorescence again the first type is over with an elongated rachis now the second type of racemos inflorescence is with shortened rachis 
Now this is a racemos inflorescence where the main axis of the inflorescence is very very short. So we say that it is shortened rashes. If you see the previous slide we discussed about elongated rashes. So now we will discuss about shortened rashes. Okay. So I will give you only the important ones here. The first one under this shortened rashes is corim. Now in corim what happens is if this is the main floral axis or the rashes you see the difference younger flowers are at the apex older flowers are at the base but notice all the flowers come to lie almost at the same level why because as we go down the pedicel or the stalk of the flowers becomes longer and longer this type of an inflorescence called corim is seen in cassia gynandropsis Okay, now this is a simple corim, isn't it? See how it becomes longer and longer as you go down so that all the flowers lie in the same axis. Now suppose we have a main flower axis again and each branch is a corim of its own. So see here. So there is a corim on the secondary axis. So this will become a compound corim. So here there was only one floral axis. Here there is a primary floral axis and there is a secondary floral axis which we can call as rachila. So this is referred to as the rachis, the main axis and this branches into a branch which is referred to as rachila and each on the rachila the arrangement is of what type? It is of corim. So we don't call this as simple corim, we call this as compound corim. Now where do we see compound corim? We see it in plants called iberis or candy tuft, pyrus and these are some examples you can and cauliflower also so iberis or candy tuft and Pyrus. The second type of inflorescence, so this was the first type that is corim. The second type of inflorescence is called umbel. Now you see and tell me in umbel what happens is this is the floral axis or the rachis. All the flowers originate from the apex of the floral axis. They seem to originate from a common point and actually there are bracts these flowers originate from bracts are those leafy outgrowths okay and in umbel it is very very important that the growth happens towards the center the older the older flowers are present towards the outer regions and as we go towards the middle the flowers become younger and younger so if i put an arrow like this it is older to younger so when you find young ones at the middle, we call this type of growth as centripetal succession. So when flowers originate from a common axis, it is referred to as umbel. Okay. Now this umbel is seen in lily and sorry, not lily, cherry and a plant which is called the Brahmi plant that is centella. Just like how we saw compound corim, if this is the main axis and from the main axis you have these branches and each branch ends with a umbel. So what would you call this? You wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't call this a simple umbel. You would call it as a compound umbel so if each branch that is origin so here also you find bracts and here also you find bracts so this is in the case of compound umbel compound umbel is seen in coriander fennel or soft and carrot so it's all about branching, isn't it? So here there was only one rachis. 
here there is a primary rachis and a secondary rachis called rachilla again here there was only one cluster of umbellate cluster of flowers at the apex of the rachis here the rachis divides into you can call these secondary degree uh, secondary branches as rachilla at the tip of the rachilla again you have umbellate clusters and like i said when you look at the umbellate clusters one thing you should note is the older flowers are towards the periphery and the younger flowers are in the middle and that's why we say that the succession is centripetal succession in the case of umbel okay so this was racemose inflorescence with a shortened rachis the last type of racemose inflorescence that i will be discussing here with you is the third the roman numerical third type which has a flattened a highly condensed and a flattened rachis in this what happens is the rachis becomes a disc like structure on this disc like structure you will find two types of flowers at the periphery you will find these flowers whose petals are thrown into straps or elongated structures like this and towards the center you will find tube like uh, the flowers which have tube like corolla on them so this and you will also find a cluster of bracts at the base of the receptacle which is nothing but the modified rachis this is referred to as a capitulum or head okay now this capitulum of head is seen in sunflower that is helianthus zinnia cosmos chrysanthemum Then we have Tagetes, Sanchez, etc. So basically, what happens here? The rachis doesn't look like rachis at all, isn't it? It has become flat. This is the floral axis. It has become flat and rounded disc shape. And one more thing, uh, at the periphery, you have these tiny flowers. We call them as the ray florets. at the periphery which have now that this is the colorful part of the sunflower the orange or the yellow portion this it's called the strap it's a modification of the petal of the ray florets and on the main part of the disc you have these individual florets which are called as the disc florets and again here the older ones are towards the periphery the younger ones are towards the disc florets i'm talking about the younger ones are towards the center so how are the flowers laid down over here again the type of succession is older towards the periphery of the disc and younger towards the central so we call it as centripetal succession okay so that completes the three types of racemose inflorescence now we shall move on to the cymose inflorescence in cymose inflorescence please remember if this is the floral axis it ends with the flower isn't it see it is ending in a flower and this is the oldest flower always the older flowers are towards the apex or in the middle and the younger flowers are towards the base of the rachis and this kind of uh, succession is referred to as basipetal succession or centrifugal succession now here only with this i can uh, tell you the first type of racemos sorry cymos inflorescence notice how there is a floral axis and it has two branches on the either sides there is one branch there is one floret on the uh, left side there is one floret on the right side now this typical type of a true cyme is referred to as a dicasial or a biparous cyme this is the most typical type it is called a true cymose inflorescence or it is referred to as a true cymose okay now example for a true cymose is it is seen in ixora it is seen in dianthus jasmine 
टीक क्लीरोडेंड्रॉन एंड द मोस्ट कॉमन यू मस्ट हैव सीन दिस द बोगेन विले so these are the examples for a dicasial why is it called a dicasial or a biparous because on both sides you have a floret emerging please remember the floral axis ends in a flower the next type is called the unicasial or sorry monocasial or uniparous sign in monocasial or uniparous cyme all of you see here the floral axis is again ending with the flower it cannot grow any more this is the rachis it is ending with the flower and then the branches will be produced only on one side see there is a floret produced on the right side if the branches if all the successive florets are produced on the same side all are produced on the right side so first one then there was a one on the right side then a successive branch on the right side again a branch on the right side again a branch on the right side this is called helicoid now see the difference again i'm showing you the rachis the floral axis and there is a flower the largest or the oldest flower here now see the branch on one side now the first branch was on the right side now the second branch will be on the left side now the third branch will be on the right side again then on the left side so alternating here all the branches are on the same side here it is first it was right then it was left then it was right then the branch was on the right this is called scorpoid sign so two types of why it is called unicasial because the branch is produced only on one side of the rachis here it was on both sides of the rachis isn't it but here it is only on one side example for helicoid is hemilia begonia drosera example for scorpioid is heliotropium okay so these are the two types of two major types of uh, cymose inflorescence one is referred to as the simple dicasial or biparous sign and then there is monocasial sign and then i will discuss one more type of cymos the last type which is called the polycasial sign polycasial is called the multiparous sign now in polycasial or multiparous sign you can see here this is a cymos then there is a branch each branch will again end on cymos so this branching happens over here so this is a bicasial again this one is a dicasial cyme now each one will again form a dicasial cyme on their own here so basically it is a repeated pattern of dicasial cyme we call it as a polycasial or a multiparous cyme this is seen in the case of the best example is callotropis and even nerium okay so this was about racemos and cymos now the last type of inflorescence will be about the mixed inflorescence that i will talk about the mixed is both racemos and cymos it is also called a special type of inflorescence now in mixed and special type the first one that i will talk about is the thyrsus thyrsus is seen in osimum that is the tulsi plant it is seen in salvia and also in coleus okay now here you have the inflorescence axis okay and there is dicasial sign occurring on opposite sides of the node see 
there are basically pairs of dicasial cymes occurring on both sides of the rachis. You know that dicasial means there are two branches that are formed. So this is called thyrsis. Then I would like to mention about verticellaster. In verticellaster what happens is if this is the mother axis, the main branch or the floral axis, then you can say that it the flower that is formed on both sides will be a normal dicasial sign. See? So dicasial, it starts off as a dicasial sign on both sides. Yes or no? And then each branch or each floret that is a product of the dicasial sign will further start growing in a scorpoid fashion. So branch on the right, branch on the left, branch on the right. Similarly here, here there was a branch here. This branch will produce a branch on its right and on the left. Okay. So each of these branches will form a scorpoid pattern. It started off as what? It started off as a dicasial sign and then it becomes monocasial. So this is seen in Lucas. Verticellaster. So it's a mix of both uh, dicasial and monocasial type of cymose inflorescence. Okay. Then we also have an inflorescence called hypanthodium, a mixed inflorescence that is called hypanthodium. Now in hypanthodium, the inflorescence axis is very, very fleshy. It has a cavity inside and there are male flowers which are present at the apex and female or gall flowers which are present at the base. So this is seen in the case of fig. The inflorescence axis is very very fleshy. This is the fleshy axis. It is urn shaped. It has a pore called osteole. It has a cavity inside and towards the upper parts of the osteole, closer to the osteole are the male flowers and further away down you will find the female plus so hypanthodium okay then the last one which is called cyathium cyathium is seen in euphorbia now in cyathium what happens is fleshy structures come together to form a cup like structure which is referred to as the bract and inside this cup you will find a single female flower surprisingly it is only the carpel the swollen part is the ovary and this is the stigma that's it this is the female flower which doesn't have any corolla uh, calyx nothing and then surrounding it you have only the stamens the male flower is represented only with stamens so female flowers have only the pistil and male flowers have only the stamen and the male flowers are known to exhibit a scorpoid pattern of growth and the female flower has a stalk, it has a ovary and it has a stigma. So it is basically a carpel. Okay. Now you know the walls of the flower. Now this proportion, the base of the flower is referred to as the thalamus. The stalk of the flower is called the pedicel. Now wherever the pedicel originates from the mother plant, at the axil you will find a leafy structure that is called the bract. If you find the leafy structure closer to the thalamus, you will call it as a bracteole. So this is a bract and this is a bracteole. Always remember a bract originates at the base of the pedicel. Okay, And then you have the calyx the units of calyx are referred to as sepals and then you have these colored parts which are referred to as the petal the entire circlet of petals that you see in the flower is referred to as wall the wall of petals is referred to as the corolla isn't it okay then you have the gynecium which is consisting of the carpel and then you have the androsium that is consisting of the stamen. The gynecium is the female reproductive part and the androsium is the male reproductive part. Okay. 
symmetry of flowers if the flower is radially symmetrical it's called actinomorphic like in hibiscus mustard datura and chili if it is bilaterally symmetrical it is called zygomorphic as in pea bean gulmohar kasaya sometimes the flower does not have a definite shape in that case it is called asymmetric that is canna so radially symmetric means no matter how if you consider the central axis any plane passing through the central axis you can divide the flower into two equal halves but in case of bilaterally symmetrical there is only one plane which will give you a left half and a right half position of the ovary notice how the ovary is the swollen part of the gynecium isn't it and see here all the parts of the flower are originating from below the ovary so therefore the ovary occupies what position it occupies a superior position so this is called hypogynous for example it is seen in mustard sun sorry china rose and brinjal and now you come to perigynous in perigynous what happens is see how the ovary is situated in the center the thalamus is extended somewhat into a cup like structure from the rim of the cup you have the petal you have the sepal you have the androecium but the level is almost the same as that of the ovary so we call this as perigynous or half inferior this half inferior or perigynous ovary is seen in the case of rose peach and plum but here you can see how the thalamus completely envelops the ovary isn't it and all the parts of the flower that is the petal the calyx the androecium they originate from above the level of the ovary so the ovary here becomes inferior it lies below all the other parts this is called epigynous this is seen in the case of guava cucumber okay so you should know the types of ovary depending upon how the other parts of the flower are disposed around the ovary and it is important to know the examples for the same if the sepals are fused the condition is called gamosepalous for example if you dissect out the flower you can see the individual sepals like this otherwise all the sepals will be united like this so if the sepals are free it is called polysepalous if it is united like this it is called gamosepalous similarly if the petals are free it is called polypetalous if the petals are united it is called gamopetalous the calyx and the corolla constitute what is referred to as the perianth and if it is a homochlamydeous flower homochlamydeous means suppose this is the thalamus there are sepals and there are petals inner ones are petals if you sepals and inner outer ones are sepals but notice both the petal and the sepal look so similar to each other you cannot distinguish between them at all then we call these units when you cannot distinguish them we call them as tepals okay such flowers where you have two whorls an inner whorl which is referred to as the petal or the uh, the petals which here you cannot call them as petals and sepals because both look exactly alike but there are two whorls one on the outside and one inner to it then you call it as homochlamydeous flowers and these units which are very very similar you can't tell uh, you can't distinguish them as petal and sepal you will simply call them as tepal and if the stamen now for example this is the petal if the stamen is attached to the petal we call the condition as epipetalous suppose this is a tepal and if it is attached to the tepal then we call the condition as epiphyllous so based on whether there is fusion of the stamen with the petal or the tepal we use the words called epipetalous and epiphyllous male part we know the units are called stamen it has a filament and it has a two lobed 
uh, anther which is called the diticus anther and sometimes the stamen is sterile it does not produce pollen grains then we call this condition as the staminode and we saw in the central region is the female reproductive part which has this structure which is called the carpel or the pistil the upper expanded part is called the stigma this is called the style and the basal bulged part is called the ovary addition of stamens i told you if the stamens are attached to the petal if the stamens are attached to the tepal now here you can see the length of the anthers in some flowers two anthers are short and two anthers are tall we call this condition as didynamis height of anthers sorry height of stamen not anther two stamens are short and two stamens are long this is seen in the case of salvia now what if four of them are tall see one two three four and two outer ones are short then we call it as tetradynamous and tetradynamous is seen in the case of mustard so variations in what variations in the length of stamen so not addition here uh, only these two are addition okay addition refers to the first two and then we have to see the variation in the length of the stamen if two are short and two are tall didynamous if four are tall and two are short tetradynamous the same thing is given over here this is four of them are tall over here and two of them are short tetradynamous two are tall two are short didynamous cohesion of fusion of stema if all the stamen are fused into a single bundle now this is the stamen if this is a bundle of filaments and only the anthers are free like this so what has fused here the filaments of all anthers has fused into a bundle then it is called mono adelphus so this is called mono adelphus suppose it is fused into two see here this forms one bundle of stamen and this solitary stamen is considered one so it is nine together plus one single this is referred to as diadelphus and here you can see there is one bundle a second bundle a third bundle a fourth bundle more than two so we call it as polyadelphus polyadelphus is seen in citrus diadelphus is seen in pea plants leguminous plants monoadelphus is seen in china rose that is hibiscus members of malvaceae Estivation is in bud condition. If you want to know how the petals and how the sepals are arranged, then you have to take a section of the bud and you can see how the petals or the sepals are arranged. Notice how here the petal, one petal or one sepal does not touch the other one or even if it touches, only the margins touch. There is no overlapping. Then we call this type of estivation as valvate estivation. This is seen in Calotropis. In some cases, see how the petal is overlapping. This is one petal, it overlaps with the other. Then it is referred to as twisted. Twisted type of estivation is seen in lady's finger. Then it is seen in cotton. And it is seen in hibiscus. That is China rose. Now here there is no definite arrangement. When there is no definite arrangement, we call it as imbricate. It is seen in the case of Kasaya and Gulmohar. And here you see there is one large petal at the back. This is referred to as the wing or the, the standard or the vexillum, which encloses two petals on the inside, which is the wings or the alley, and which encloses two, which are fused together. So it is one plus two unfused plus two fused. This is called vexillary estivation. Vexillary estivation is seen in pea, bean, etc. Mostly leguminous plants. Okay. If the gynoecium has individual carpels, see, each one is a carpel here. Each one 
has an ovary has a short stigma and sorry has a style and a stigma so it's basically a cluster of carpels which is not fused then we say the condition is apocarpus apocarpus is seen in apple in lotus and rose in custard apple lotus and rose but in syncarpus it just looks like a single pistil but if you take a section you can see it will have multiple compartments inside it probably that means it is formed by the fusion of more than one carpel this is referred to as syncarpus so individual carpels can easily be this can easily be seen apocarpus it forms a composite structure by fusion and it is called syncarpus placentation now this is the ovary now all the ovules are attached to the ventral suture of the ovary in a row actually in two rows okay then axial placentation see you have taken a section to see the placentation you have to take the section of the ovary in axial placentation all the ovules are arranged along the central axis in a multi locular locule means the compartment inside so there is one compartment a second compartment a third compartment marginal is seen in p axial is seen in lemon in china rose in tomato parietal is see how it's a single locule there is a single compartment inside and how the ovules are arranged on the inner wall but along the periphery this is parietal like in the case of mustard and argimon basal there is only one ovule attached to the base of this ovary this is in the case of sunflower and marigold free central there is a stalk which emerges from the base of the ovary there is no septa it is a single compartment all along the stalk you can see ovules are attached this is seen in dianthus and primrose fruit we have the most common example for fruit is the mango this is belonging to a category called a droop so you can see the innermost covering the stony layer here is called the endocarp and the middle fleshy covering is mesocarp the outer one is called the exocarp inside the endocarp there will be a seed isn't it in case of mango the mesocarp is fleshy in case of coconut the mesocarp is fibrous fruit develops from the wall of the ovary after fertilization now seed if you see the dicot seed there are two cotyledons which are rich in uh, endosperm and you can see the embryonal axis the part of the embryonal axis that forms the shoot is the plumule that forms the root is the radical okay and the point of attachment of the two uh, cotyledon below that point of attachment you have the hypocotyl and above that point of attachment you have the epicotyl okay in a monocot seed you can see there is only one cotyledon the shield like cotyledon which i am highlighting here which i am shading here this is referred to as the scutellum and see how the endosperm has a proteinaceous covering which is called the aleuron layer the plumule and the radical are covered by protective sheaths which are referred to as coleoptile for the plumule and coleoriza for the radical now technical dis description of the typical flowering plant usually we talk about its habit where it lives its root its stem its leaf whether it has what type of inflorescence whether the flower has a pedicel or not if it does not have a pedicel it is sessile whether it has a bract or if it doesn't it's called ebracteate if it has all the whorls it's complete otherwise it is incomplete if the parts of the whorls like petals and sepals are in multiples of 5 or in multiples of 3 if the flower has both andrisium and gynesium or it has only one of them if it is radially symmetrical or bilaterally symmetrical or if it does not have any symmetry at all 
Then we also should see number of sepals in the calyx, number of petals in the corolla, perianth, perianth I told you, it is the outermost walls which enclose the androsium and the gynoecium. In most cases the perianth has an outer wall called calyx which has green sepals and it has an inner wall called petals or corolla. In such flowers where you can clearly distinguish two different walls in the perianth that is outer calyx and inner corolla we call such flowers as heterochlamydeus heterochlamydeus flowers then we have to talk about stamen number of carpels isn't it so number of how many carpels have fused together and how many compartments are there within the carpel that is referred to as what what do you call the compartments it is called the locule then these are the symbols for sepals we use the symbol k for corolla we use the symbol for calyx it is k for corolla it is 5 fusion is represented by putting brackets if all the corolla or, or calyx like in gamo sepalous condition in gamo petalous condition you use a bracket and for stamen and androsium we use what is called as a androsium if there is a single wall as in if all the stamen form one circle then you can just say see a5 you can say now if there is one more ring on the outside one more circlet of stamens present outside then how many walls are there two walls are there so you will write a 5 plus 5 there is an inner circle of stamen and an outer circle of stamen sometimes a stamen may be bundled like in diadelphus we had seen a bundle of 9 plus 1 separate in p then if there are indefinite number the number keeps varying you put a infinity indefinite and fused always for fusion you put the figure in brackets carpel for that you represent it with a g if they are free you just write the numerical if they are sin carpus you cover it in brackets and you can also depict the position of the ovary if you write underline the ovary like this that means the ovary is superior if you put a dash beside the ovary like this it is half inferior if you put a dash above the ovary that means the ovary is inferior okay and if you want to show addition now say for example here the stamen i told you this is the petal and the stamen is attached to the petal in that case you write corolla you write androsium and you show a line a curve connecting the two okay epiphyllous condition in epiphyllous the stamen i told you it is not petal that the stamen is attached to it is the tepal. Tepal is something which you cannot distinguish as petal and sepal. Isn't it? In that case, instead of C, you will write P. And superior ovary is like this. Underline it. If you put a line above, it is inferior ovary. In Liliaceae, you have Liliaceae members. In Liliaceae members, they are all perennial herbs. They grow throughout the year. They have simple leaves with alternate uh, arrangement. They don't have a stipule. The leaves don't have stipule. The flowers are umbellate clusters like this. See, they are solitary or they may be cymose with umbellate clusters like this. And the floral formula is the flowers have bract. Now see here, the flowers have bract and this is a tepal. See, you cannot distinguish between this. There is no calyx and corolla. All of them look alike. So when these two walls look alike, you call these units as tepal. And see how there is one, two, three outer ring and one, two, three inner ring. So we say that there are two walls of perianth, that is tepals, isn't it? So the flower has bract. They are actinomorphic. They are bisexual. Perianth has 3 plus 3. Why am I putting bracket? Because see, they're all fused together to form a tube like structure. Androsium, see how the stamen is attached to the perianth. So, androsium and perianth I must connect here, but the stamen are free. So, 3 plus 3 in two walls. And then gynoecium is superior. And notice there are 1, 2, 3. 3 locules with axial placentation. So, 3. 
that means it is tricarpillary syncarpus trilocular so you can say that three and i have put it in brackets okay please learn the examples for liliaceae from the ncrt thoroughly it is very important for your competitive exam then for fabaceae what's the floral formula very quickly for fabaceae the flower is zygomorphic so put a percentage sign then you can see both gynoecium and androecium now observe this side of the slide so you will write bisexual then you will say see how the calyx is consisting of five sepals which are united so calyx and i will write five within brackets corolla there is one standard petal there are two wings or alae and there are two smaller ones which are fused together called keel or carina so corolla is one standard petal plus two wings which are free plus two keel or carina which i am enclosing inside bracket because it is fused correct and then see the gynoecium has only one carpel inside it's a single carpel with a single compartment inside bearing one ovule it's a section so you can see only one ovule but it has many ovules along the margin it has marginal placentation so gynoecium you put an underline and you write in brackets two solanaceae solanaceae you can see again now observe the floral diagram here as i write so for solanaceae what am i going to write it is bilaterally sorry radially symmetrical or actinomorphic it is bisexual okay now see the sepals all the sepals are united so i must write calyx with five sepals which are united valvately arranged then see the petals all the petals are also fused so i must write corolla with five within brackets and see how the androecium has stamen the stamen is attached to the petal addition of stamen with the petal so androecium five i have to connect the androecium with the corolla that is the petal because it is addition and then see the gynoecium there is a oblique septa here and how many compartments this is one compartment and this is one compartment and axial placentation superior ovary so put an underline and write two and put it in brackets because it is syncarpus bicarpillary with two locules inside so please go through some of the important examples for example for family liliaceae you have to remember about some of the ornamental plants like tulips gloriosa then you have medicinal plants like aloe and then you have vegetables like asparagus and then you have colchicum autumn nail from which a drug called colchicine is extracted okay and then for fabaceae you should remember that you have gram all these are leguminous plants that is fabaceae so you have gram pea dal such as same dal or arhar dal which we call as tur dal over here then we have moong dal then we have soya we have sources of oil such as soya and groundnut yes or no and then we have dye producing plants like indigo ferra then we have vegetables sorry we uh, already included the eatables that is gram pea sem arhar tul moong etc uh, tur moong etc then oil which is including soya and groundnut and dye which is indigo ferra then we have lupin which is ornamental plant sweet pea which is again ornamental and medicinal plant is licorice muleti licorice which is called muleti is a medicinal plant the scientific name is glycyrrhiza glabra then for solanaceae for solanaceae you have to remember about the ornamental plant that is petunia then you have medicinal plant that is ashwagandha 
Ashwagandha and Belladonna are medicinal plants. Then we have vegetables like potato, tomato which is a fruit actually and brinjal which is again a fruit and we have spices such as chili which is a fruit again. Then we have tobacco which is a fumigatory. Okay, now in case of Fabaceae, you also have to remember about some of the sources of fodder for animals like Sesbania, Trifolium. These are some of the sources of fodder, and you can also include sources of fiber like sun hemp. All right, so this completes the chapter of morphology of flowering plants. We will meet again in the next lecture. Thank you. Have a nice day.